We can't hear you, Pastor. Let's start now. As you know, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. <clears throat> he who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he does not believe in the only begotten son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. <clears throat> believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, for by grace you've been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Before we get into the word of God this afternoon, especially this particular study let's pause for a moment of silence and exercise first john 1 9 which says that if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and because we're delving into the territory that uh, addresses what's going to happen to satan and a third of the angels let's make sure we're filled with the spirit of god so that we can focus on the information and not be distracted so let's pause for a moment of silence and pray, and then I'll open with prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to assemble together. And uh, we're grateful for this time that we can just come together and know you more through your word. We have in record um, the things that are forthcoming, kind of like a preview of what's going to happen during the tribulation period. So I pray that we would be focused. And if there's anything vying for our attention, we would just lay those aside for the hour. We know, Father, that this is very critical. This will let us know why it is vital to evangelize, why it's important to get into Bible doctrine, why it's so important to prioritize you and your word. And I've been championing this for a number of years. And I hope, Lord, that after this study, that people will understand, <clears throat> those who are listening to this, whether in, in person in Elisa Vejo, online on YouTube, or just via Zoom as we are gathered together. I hope they will see that this is foundational to understanding why God had sent his only begotten son and why it is that you will allow people to be devastated and nearly wiped out lest they re um, confess and accept or believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. So I pray, Lord, that the believers of uh, Church of Hope especially would see the importance of prioritizing you as we're about to embark um, on the rest of tri the tribulation period. And we're going to see firsthand what it is that you have in store for those who are going to be left here on this earth, lest they are raptured out of here. So it is my prayer, Lord, that as we uh, look through this particular study, that we would take seriously the things that we're going to see and recognize that no one, pretty much everyone is going to be annihilated lest they come to faith in Jesus Christ. So help us see the importance and the significance and why it is we should share with new light. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're moving through. We're going to particularly focus in on the tribulation period. Uh, this will be uh, taken from chapters 8 through 11 of the book of Revelation. You're, you're welcome to look through your Bible, in your Bibles, but I will also have it posted in front of you. And those online, you will also be able to see this. So you'll see what the word of God actually says. So now for the text. So here is the order that we're going to be looking at. Chapters 1 through 3, we have the vision of Jesus and the seven letters to the seven churches. We covered that. And then each ends with a promise of Jesus' second coming. Chapters four through seven, the throne of God with the scroll with seven seals, and then Christ wipes away every tear when you get to chapter seven, verse 17. <clears throat> when you get to chapter eight, 
through 11, you're going to see the seven trumpets. Christ will reign forever and ever. By the time you hit chapter 11, verse 15, Christ, the dragon, and the seven bowls. So you're going to see seven trumpets, seven seals. We saw that. And then the seven bowls that will follow the seven trumpets. And then chapter 17 through 19, the harlot on seven hills and the bride, the rider and the white horse, chapter 19, verse 16. By the time you get to 20, you'll hear about the king reigns. And I think you know who that is, the judge and the lake of fire. So that's going to be uh, very frightening unless you're on the side of Jesus Christ. The new heaven and the new earth. And I've said this no, numerous times. The Christian or the believer is not going to be on, on in heaven. We don't today we go, uh, we die absent from the body to be present with the Lord. But after that, we're going to be on the new earth that God is going to create. He's going to destroy this earth, and this will be the new place that we're going to dwell. That's called the new earth. And Jesus ends in chapter 22, 20. I am coming quickly. <clears throat> in chapter 8, 1, 2, 3, you, you see the seventh seal, the golden censer. When the lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And then I saw seven angels who stood before God. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. <clears throat> and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar. And notice what happens next. He took the censer filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. So the direction now is hurled on, onto earth. And there were pearls of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. That happened shortly after the censor hit the earth. Verse 5. <clears throat> That's the beginning in Revelation 8. We see a series of divine plagues of godly biblical proportions. They parallel the plagues of Egypt, but this time they are worldwide. It's not in a, a localized location or place. They are warnings offering the ungodly a chance to repent. They are judgments that go beyond natural explanation. With the breaking of the seventh seal, a new phase of God's judgment begins as the seven angels prepare to blow the seven their seven trumpets. The seventh seal is a dramatic pause, the calm before the storm. This total silence is possibly the first and only time heaven has been placed in total silence. Remember, the heavenly hosts constantly praised God, but there was this pause in heaven. So they were, I guess, getting ready for the censor being thrown onto earth. What comes now is contained on the scroll as Jesus breaks the seventh seal, the, the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments, 14 judgments to follow, are inside the inner scroll previously held by the final seal. The seven angels mentioned are special. They are parallel to the four angels holding back the four winds. These are the seven angels who stand before God. Though not called archangels in Revelations, they appear to be the seven noted archangels, Uriel, Raphael, Raquel, Michael, Serequel, Gabriel, and Remiel, identified in Jewish and Christian tradition. <clears throat> Only Michael, Mike, Michael and Gabriel are named by name in the Bible. The seven trumpets. 
they are the first century trumpets normally connected to warfare. These were signaling devices, not playing devices. So they weren't designed to play music. They were to alert the people around that war is about to take place. Destruction. In addition to the seven angels, we also see an eighth, one who receives a golden censer. <clears throat> Translation and clarification of the verse on incense. It best translates the meaning incense equal the prayer of the saints on earth. Importance of the incense is its effectiveness. In church, the effectiveness comes from the amount of smoke produced. Much incense magnifies the amount of all the prayers and it is shown to be very effective, which is why we as believers must always be in the mode of praying. We pray for people that we know, we pray for each other, because it's very, very effective as it rises before the throne of grace. We always talk about the throne of grace, um, praying for each other, praying for someone who's not feeling well. Prayers are very, very effective as they are used properly. The scripture is replete with people praying on behalf of others. The, the prayer of a righteous man is effective and accomplishes much. So the Bible recognizes the prayer of the righteous person rose before God from the hand of the angel for the incense to rise around and go up before the enormity of God, it has to be incredibly effective and productive. Whereas God has previously told the martyrs to wait a little longer, now the justice prayed for is about to be delivered with the sounding of the trumpets. Remember earlier when we saw last time, that the uh, martyrs were asking, when are you going to avenge us? Well, it's about to happen. The prayers have ascended before God, and now he transforms them and hurls them back to earth. So he chucks it and throws it towards the earth. We have fully moved to judgment mode. It's fighting mode. It's warfare mode now. The sensor being hurled to earth as a blazing object anticipates the blowing of the first three trumpets. John will see blazing objects strike the earth three different times and each time with cataclysmic results. So something is coming to the earth and John is going to do his best to describe what he thinks he sees because he's never seen this before. And so three times it strikes the earth and with cataclysmic results, devastating results. The four phenomena, the pearl of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake occurred when God revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai, you'll recall. So that all took place as they were conversing as God was speaking to Moses. If you're not sure about that, go back and you'll notice what is described in detail in the word in Exodus. <clears throat> now they occur as God reveals himself, his divine judgment upon mankind, and, and it will happen two more times in Revelation. They hear prelude before the first trumpet. Then they will occur after the seventh judgment, and then after the pouring out of the seventh bowl of God's judgment. These are awesome manifestation of the presence of God and his acting in judgment. No more grace. Grace is done. He's waited for everyone. Now it's time to play ball. The seven trumpets, six to eight, Revelation eight. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood and these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up do you see the devastation there and what what, what came down it was hail with and fire mixed with blood i'm going to sometimes pause or repeat this because i want you to see 
this cataclysmic event that's taking place. All your unbelieving family and friends, if they're not going to acquiesce to Jesus Christ, they will have to live through this. It's best to run against them and say, look, regardless of being uncomfortable, being embarrassed, be ri being ridiculed, you need to hear this. You don't have to tell them about the tribulation. This is recorded for you and for me. The, the Revelation, book of Revelation is, isn't really necessarily designed to scare people into heaven, but it's designed for us to get busy with sharing Christ. That's the reason why we're studying this, okay? So the first angel, verse 7, blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And so it wasn't dropping on the earth. It was hurled. It was thrown. And a third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up. And all the green grass was what? Burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a mountain, a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. Did you guys get that? So after the hail with fire mixed with blood was thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was devastated, was burned up, a third of the trees was burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Now a second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain. So John was describing this and saying, well, it's kind of like a mountain. All I know is that it was burning with fire. It was just coming through the air. It was burning with fire and it was thrown into the sea. And guess what happened when it impacted the sea? A third of the sea became blood. So after everything was burned up, now the, the sea became blood, a third of the sea. So here's what you have when we compare the trumpet judgments along with the plague that took place in Egypt. Remember the plagues that Pharaoh tried to, to dodge? He thought he could kind of keep uh, the Egyptians as slaves. So it wasn't until um, God had to deal with Pharaoh on a with plagues. So on the left side, I have the trumpet judgments. On the right side, there, there's similarities here, right? So on the left side, you have the trumpet, the first trumpet, hail with fire. Plagues on earth, hail with fire. Exodus 9, 22, 26 versus Revelation 8, 7. So I put these together so that you can see the similarity um, even though there's thousands of years apart from each other, I want you to see that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, right? So he, he had dealt with an individual who thought he could arm wrestle with God and win, Pharaoh, in other words, in Exodus 9, Exodus 7. So the third trumpet resulted with rivers turning to blood. With the plague, the Nile turns to blood. Exodus 7. The fourth trumpet dealt with darkness. We find, we'll see this in Revelation 8, 12. With Pharaoh, he also um, caused the, the land to turn dark. You find this in Exodus 10. And then the fifth uh, trumpet, we're going to see the demonic locusts. In uh, Exodus 10, when dealing with Pharaoh, natural locusts, they were all over the place. But here we're going to see something different with these demonic locusts. The, the sixth trumpet, widespread death. With Pharaoh, widespread death. Again, Exodus 12, 29 to 30. So you have this chart where you see that God acted like this in a previous time. But people forget about that or they don't care. They're like, well, it ain't going to happen again. As I said before, it's kind of like the 10 lepers. You, they were healed but they forget, and so they forget to give thanks to God. And so please, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget what God has saved you from. Don't forget what God has helped you with, because we will have this tendency to get so lax that we, oh, well, you know, I'm not struggling anymore. I'm healed from this now. Please don't do that. Don't be like the 10 lepers. Play ball, get up off your chairs, do something, and advance the cause of Christ. Time is of the essence. This is why I want you to see what's forthcoming. The trumpet judgments have three purposes, which is what we're going through now. To hinder the Antichrist's empire, to warn the unbelievers of increased judgment to come, to rally the saints, that's you and me, to gather in prayer and for me, advance the cause of Christ. Because 
one thing to pray that'll go before the throne of grace, but it's another to get the word out there. We are commanded to make disciples of all nations. And the last two trumpet judgments are intensified and result in the death of one third of the human race. <clears throat> so now, verses eight through six is the transition from the seven seals to period of final judgment. One interpretive view is that the seven seals represent the period of human history up to the final judgment that is begun with the seven trumpets. With the sounding of the first trumpet, the earth moves into a phase of divine judgment that it cannot survive. The first trumpet result is similar to God's prediction in Joel 2. 30. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. That's taken from Joel 2.30. It is like but much worse than the seven plagues on Egypt. This is a worldwide ecological disaster. One third of the earth is burned. One third of the trees burned up and all the green grass burned up. This plague is devastating, but not yet fatal. They will still survive. God will allow them to think it twice, think it over. The plague on nature is meant as a divine warning of those disasters to come, just like the ancient plagues on Egypt. The second trumpet is a repeated pattern from verse 5 when the golden censer was hurled down to earth. John can only give his interpretive language of the event, something like a huge mountain burning with fire. We don't know the exact mechanism of God's wrath, but it is obviously significant. It was like a mountain burning and it smacked onto the ocean. And all I know is that it, a third turned to blood. As God works his judgment, it is important to see that he who created all sea life has the authority and perfect justice to destroy a third of it in his will. He created it and now he's destroying it. So when you get to Revelation 8, 9, listen to this. A third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ship, the ships were destroyed. So it was all annihilated. The third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. So it all got contaminated by this great star. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. So every water that was left, bitter. The mention of the human toll, a third of the ships were destroyed, demonstrates the death rates that will accompany this. The fact that God is still only destroying a fraction, one third, shows that even as he's exercising a severe judgment, it is not yet completely fatal. God is still giving severe warnings and the opportunity for those alive for repentance, but they're hard-headed. They still are callous. They don't want to. The third trumpet appears to be a meteor named Wormwood. Wormwood is an extra bitter plant, but one that normally is not poisonous, but it's bitter. God has already struck the oceans. Now he destroys a third of the fresh waters of the earth. This is a parallel with Exodus and the plague which turned the Nile into blood. That's why I put that chart there so that you can see the comparison between the two. The one in Revelation, though, is catastrophic. It's global in scope. So the effect of these are enormous. If one-third of the oceans are destroyed, one-third of the trees and all of the green grass, and now one-third of the fresh water, imagine the impact this has on food sources for humanity and the destruction of animals. 
So if you were living during this time and you won't, thank God, you're going to be taken away through the rapture. But if you were, if a third of the oceans were destroyed, no more uh, surfing done, one third of the trees and all the green grass, and now a third of the fresh water are gone, imagine the impact this has on food sources. What's left? No green grass. Most of the trees are gone. A third of the trees are gone. The water has been contaminated. One third has been contaminated with, uh, with wormwood or bitter water now. What are you going to survive on? The fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light might be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining and likewise a third of the night. So everything is thrown off kilter now. Sun's affected. It doesn't give its light as bright as it was would. The moon as well. So that it might keep from shining and likewise, likewise a third of the night. Verse 13. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice. Now imagine this. Okay. I'm reading this to you for you. And you can see it in front of you. But I want you to imagine what is odd about this as I'm reading this. I look and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice. I mean, how many eagles speak? This eagle is speaking with a voice, a loud voice, and it flew directly overhead. And it's saying, whoa, 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 to those who dwell on the earth. I mean, if I heard a, an eagle with a voice speaking from with a loud voice saying, whoa, 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 I'm out of there. Here's an eagle. Whoa, whoa, whoa to those who dwell on the earth. In other words, those of you who are here, I'm out. I'm warning you at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. That's the warning coming from this talking eagle. With the fourth trumpet, it is important to remember that God promised Noah in Genesis 8.22 that as long as the earth endures, day and night will never cease. Genesis 8.22, he promised that to Noah. This event, even after the destruction already done, is the beginning of the end of the world. So you want? are you interested in time? Well, here you go. Start with eight, um, this trumpet judgment. This event after this, the destruction already done is the beginning of the end of the world, the beginning of the end. With one third of the light from the sky blotted out, life on earth now will quickly become impossible. There is like much of the, of the revelation, no time sequence given here. So we don't know how long these events take to unfold, but the close interrelatedness of the first three seem to be close together as you study it. One thing to note, God created everything and gave humanity all the good things of creation. Here in the end, he's taking it away. So he gave everything and remember in the creation account, it was all good. Now he's devastating everything. He's taking it all away from humanity. Even as this happens, an eagle sounds in the warning of much more worse to come. The eagle is possibly an angel as he pronounces one woe for each of the impending three judgments. So whether it's an angel or this eagle, if it's flying around saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I know some interpreters view that as a real eagle. Um, still frightening because it's still giving a warning. And after all that had happened prior to that eagle, the devastation of the trees, the green grass and the water, I'm going to be really paranoid at that point. So each of the impending three judgments, much worse is to come. Notice that the woes are directed to those who dwell on the earth. The earth dwellers who live for this world, those who are remaining, there is a pattern in the judgments and the seal. The first four of each have affected the earth and the last three depict heavenly and spiritual scenes. Results of the first four trumpets. A third of the earth and vegetation was burned. 
a third of the sea no longer habitable for sea life. So everything that was there, dead, because it turned to blood. So imagine the, the sea life. If it was a third was turned to blood, then you're probably, you, you see right now a lot of um, seals and sharks, um, a lot of fish um, are on shore these days. A lot of them are dead, dying or dead. You see this all over the world. They're, they're wondering why people, why um, sea life is being washed up to shore. They're dying, right? You see this, they're in hot, in spots around the world that there are massive sea life washing up to shore, dying for no reason at all. Well, here a third of the sea is no longer habitable for sea life. So if a third of the oceans are Um, having blood in it, then imagine the sea life, what that's going to look like. They can't sustain life. The whales, the fish, I mean, they're all going to belly up and wash to shore. So you're going to have this massive stink because of all the fish and everything that's washed up into shore. They can't live anymore because the blood has been has contaminated the ocean. So what's that going to smell like? So just the houses nearby, and I would think even miles away, you you have this stench that is going through through the cities. I mean, imagine the oceans near Newport Beach, Costa Mesa, um, Costa Mesa, Dana Point. All those waters, if it's contaminated with blood and it kills all the sea life, then what is it gonna do to the neighboring areas? What's that gonna smell like? Have you ever walked into an area where it's dead? You smell the, um, you smell dead fish? Well, that's kind of what it's going to be like, I would think. And everything is washed up on the shore because it can't sustain life in a sea of blood. And so a third of the sea no longer habitable for sea life. So they are going to just wash up to the shore. A third of man's shipping destroyed. So all the ships that are uh, transporting goods. Remember recently, Long Beach had a stall in supplies. And all everyone's waiting for all their supplies and their orders. Uh, you can forget it. Amazon is not going to be able to ship during this time. A third of the world's fresh water is poison. So all sea life is going to be dead. The sun, the moon, and stars were darkened. Day becomes only 16 hours. It's shortened. So with all of these taking place, what's Earth going to look like? We're out of there, by the way. We're gone. And a fifth of the angel, and the fifth angel blew his trumpet. And I saw a star fallen from heaven to Earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9, 2. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit. And furnace from the shaft rose, smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. So please visualize this. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke of the shaft. So it was this dark smoke was going up and it covered the, the sun and the air were darkened. The sun and the air were darkened with the smoke that came from the shaft. Then from the smoke, so in the smoke as it's going up, Notice what happens. Locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. So let me go back and read that again. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power. They're given power like the power of scorpions. What was given power like scorpion? The locusts that were now coming out of the smoke. Notice what happens next. Verses 9, 1 through 12. Well, not here. Describe the fifth trumpet, the first woe. This is much, there is much debate about the identity of the angel in verse 1. He is referred to as fallen from heaven to earth, and the Greek translation is accurate, accurate in this. If this is the case, then the fallen, this, then this is a fallen angel possibly Satan. And again, there's many who have a differing view on this. <clears throat> but possibly, I'm leaning towards Satan. But there is no other point in Revelation where God uses a fallen angel to do his work. 
but I, I think it's still Satan, and I'll get to that in the end, towards the end. And why would God entrust the devil himself with the keys to his own prison? Likely, this is an angel, not demon or the devil, who returns in verse 20, verse 1, to open the bottomless pit to bind Satan. But we'll see more of this towards the end. But could but could be a parallel between two angels, one fallen to open the pit and one good to close and bind the devil himself. Not definitive for one view or the other. Still thinking, leaning towards Satan. We'll look at that when we get there. The bottomless pit is clearly the lake of fire and it is the same as the demon's legion referred to in Luke 8. 30 to 31. They begged him not to command them to depart to depart into the abyss. Jesus in, is in complete control of the abyss in verse 3, 7. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. His representative, the start angel, acts under his control. This is where Satan will be bound during Jesus' 1,000-year reign in the future. This is called the millennium. This is what where we will come back and set up his kingdom with him. And we will co-rule with him or co-reign with Christ. Smoke like the smoke of a great furnace parallels numerous Old Testament references. Used to depict the wrath of God. Taken from, you can see this in 2 Samuel 22.9. Psalms 18.8, Job 41.20, where you see this great smoke that is being dispersed uh, during the, this chapter. Designates the day of Yahweh from Joel 2, verse 30. The locusts are empowered to especially dangerous to humans, but though under the command of the angel of the bottomless pit, you find this in 9.11, they show God's con complete control in his limiting their actions and attacks. So they're still under his directions. So just like in Jonah, or not Jonah, um, Job, you see that when Satan wanted to attack Job, God said, you can do anything except you see the boundary set forth by God himself. In this case here, um, you also see that God's control in limiting their actions, the locusts that is, and so they're dangerous, but they have to comply with God's directives. So Joel 2.10 describes locusts so dense that the sun and moon were darkened and the stars no longer shine. This prophecy also refers to the cloud of winged creatures coming in judgment of Israel. The locusts also reenact the eighth Egyptian plague. So they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or, or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So the target now are those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Now, what does that look like? I don't know. That's been a burning question for me throughout the years. But the, the locusts can somehow know who are the ones who have the seal of God on their foreheads during this time. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will attempt to commit suicide, but they can't. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. So they're trying to kill themselves. They're trying to do all kinds of things, but death will flee. God is going to permit them to suffer. Please note, they're going to be stung by these locusts, but they can't kill them. But they cannot kill themselves. God is going to permit them to endure this for a minimum of five months. You see that in verse 5? They are allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. 
And in those days, people will seek death. They will look for death. They will try to find ways to kill themselves and will not find it. So they will long to die, meaning I want to die, but death will flee from them. So now they are regretting being there. But still, we're going to find out that they still will not bow the knee to God. These locusts are restrained from any damage to their normal diet. They now can only torment the individuals who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So torment means pick on them, okay? Sting them, but they just can't kill them. Remember that the judgment against vegetation has already taken place. So now they're going after humans. These next judgments are against humanity, so vegetation will be spared. Remember verses seven, chapter 7, 3 to 4, where the saints are sealed on their foreheads with the seal of God, they are safe. These judgments are retribution for those who have rejected God and have refused to turn from their evil and the world of sin. God also restrains these creatures and forbids them to kill. They can only torment. Can't kill them, but they can torment. So these locusts have the capacity, apparently, to kill. But God said, nope, just torment them. Give them a difficult time, but don't kill them. This torment is linked to the next, which we will see a third of these same people killed. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were that looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. So the horses, I want you to visualize this. They had faces that looked like humans. They had on their heads what looked like crowns of gold. So these locusts had crowns of gold, looked like it, and their faces looked like human faces, their hair like human's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings when they were flying was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. That's why I stressed and emphasized five months. I wanted to see that. I wanted to drill that inside so that you realize that these were going after people, and the pain would go on for five months per sting. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His Hebrew, his name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is called Abilon. Revelation 9, 11. The locusts are one of the most bizarre creatures described. A combination of locust, scorpion, and warrior. In addition to bringing physical torment, they also instill terror by their appearance. Bizarre looking. Look, they have faces that look like humans. They had crowns on their head, long hair like women. Bizarre. What look like crowns of gold is indicative of the victory they have over their human targets. Imagine the, the, the tormenting coming from the locusts designed to win. Breastplates of iron. What look like crowns of gold is indicative of the victory they have over their human targets. Their human faces seem to indicate their cunning and intelligence, which are far out, which are far out of proportion with insects. They, bugs don't look like that. The five-month period of treatment corresponds to the five-month lifespan of locusts. The angel of the bottomless pit named here Abaddon, which translates the destruction, is Satan. He controls the actions of the demonic beast and shows his evil 
by attacking those who have followed and have been obedient to him. The first woe has passed. Here we go again with the woe. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day and the month and the year were released to kill what? A third of mankind. Revelation 9.15, if you want to check that out in scripture. The voice John hears is Jesus. It is a singular voice, not multiple voices, and it gives a command. Also, it is not identified as an angel as in the previous passages. The four angels are bound, an important distinction. These are fallen angels or else there is no need to bind them. The Euphrates rivers is the eastern border of the land promised to Abraham as noted in Genesis 15, 18. It is possible in the reading that the hour and day and month and year could dictate a time period instead of the date of their release. If this is the case, it is believed that the, this represents 13 months, a time of period during which they, were, they will kill a third of the population. This exactness of this release, time and date, further illustrates God's total control, the precisionness and the accuracy of his control. God is always exact and precise in everything that he does. He's a perfect God. He does things perfectly so that whatever you are going through, whatever I am going through, if our perfect God allows and permits certain things to happen, you can trust that he's got this in control and it's lodged into his divine will. So whatever it is that you're going through, that's a part of his plan for you and for me, and we can trust him in that couple more things here and then we'll probably have to pick this up later on so there's still a lot more so let me just go through a few more verses here revelation 9 16 the number of mounted troops was twice ten thousand times ten thousand i heard their number and this is how i saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them they wore breastplates the color of fire of sapphire and of sulfur and on the heads of these horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. They were killed. A third of the mankind was killed by the fire and smoke that came out of their mouths. This is 200 million demons in this plague. To picture the impact and the power of the three plague, the fire, smoke, and sulfur, think of a volcanic eruption packed down into the size of a horse and multiplied by 200 million. That's serious power coming out of the mouth of these horses. The three are separate plagues that are combined into one dramatic and incredible deadly effect and they're not alone because the horses have another weapon that they use. John notes the colors of the horse's demon armor. This is significant armor that apparently kills them or keeps them from being killed. The tricolor scheme is an important symbolic. Each color represents one of the plagues that comes from the demons. Red, fire, blue, smoke, yellow, sulfur. The breastplates and their colors symbolize the deadly nature of their plagues as well as their strength. The heads of the horse demons being those of lions is another indicator of their deadliness. Lions are well known and more so in the ancient times for their lethality to humans. They're deadly. They're destructive. 
lions eat humans and their threat here is also symbolic of the humans who are being killed having been consumed <coughs> by their sinfulness to the point of refusing god's grace so all to this to this point they're resisting god and we'll see more at, towards the end of the tribulation that they continue to resist god again a third of the remaining population is killed for the power of the horses, this is, we'll stop here, but let me just take this through because we're on a roll. 19 to 21. For the power of the horses is in their mounts and in their tails. There's power in the tail of a horse? For their tails are like serpents with heads. Did you get that? Their tails were like serpents with heads, and by means of them, they wound. So they can hurt and destroy with just their tails alone. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. So they're saying, John is saying, look, even though they're seeing all this, they're still not stopping the worshiping of the demons and idols, statues, in other words, gold and silver and bronze made of stone and wood. They're trying to worship, probably saying like Baal, uh, when Elijah was dealing with the prophets and the Baal, um, they were saying, oh, you know, help us from this Messiah. Hide us, protect us from this Jesus. So they were worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone, which cannot see, hear, or walk. There's the statues. They have no relationship at all they have no power nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or thefts so th this is where we'll conclude for today because there's still a lot more to cover but i want you to see the devastation that will take place this is a preview of what is forthcoming ladies and gentlemen so just like in a movie theater when you see previews of movies that are coming next year or in six months this is what is forthcoming. The Bible is the only book, the only record of what is coming in the future. We take pride in looking up the news and trying to check social media, trying to figure out what is trending, what is viral, to find out what's happening around the world. This is what's going to happen on the world, on this world, on this earth, in the future. So please join me in advancing the cause of Christ. Do not let your friends or loved ones live during this period because this is going to happen and whoever is going to be here is going to be in terrible shape so having said that let's close in a word of prayer and then we'll finish this up or go through as far as we can again next week so invite your friends and send a link if they can't come but certainly invite them to church if they can if they're in the local area so that they could get the full impact audio and video almost like a movie there in elisa viejo so let's close in a word of prayer and thank God for the fact that we are on his side. He is on our side. Let's pray. Father, thank you as always for allowing us to study your word. Truly, we are at awe as far as what is going to take place in the future. And yet people are not going to want to repent of their sins. They're going to still worship uh, demons and those statues that are made of uh, things of man crafted by uh, jewelry, gold, and um, rubies, and all kinds of things that are just going to be void and, and null when it comes to answering the prayers of the people who are trying to walk away from God and trying to protect themselves from the living God. Lord, I just pray that as we move through this particular study, as we're looking at the tribulation period, which is ultimately coming from your word, book of revelation that we would all stand together and lock shields and recognize that truly time is of the essence and we don't have much more time i'm sensing that the rapture is just around the corner we'll probably see it in our lifetime and so before you rapture us out of here i pray that we would take seriously the cause of christ and that we would tell people in the highways and byways that jesus christ will give everlasting life to those who would simply believe in him for it we know that you love the world so much that you uh, gave your only begotten son that by believing in him, they can have life everlasting. And so, Father, 
I pray that we would rally the people together, not just in Church of Hope, but those around the world who would would lock shields with us and just advance the cause of Christ. But truly, these are going to be terrible times, those who are going to be left behind. But especially my desire is that those who are a part of our Bible classes on Tuesday and Wednesday, we have a, a strong number on both nights, as well as the members of Church of Hope, in which I am proud of, I know, Sometimes it could be difficult for just coming together in an empty place. But at the same time, Lord, we know that we're not there for an individual in the front. We're there for the individual who is above us. And so, Father, I pray that you would encourage each person there and recognize that they are doing a fantastic job of holding the line, recognizing that there is the potential of packing the location as we pull together, inviting people to learn about your word especially Bible doctrine, as we pull together and get into the doctrines over time. But at this point, we're studying the future of this world that is forthcoming. And so I pray, Lord, that this would be a time to recharge and to reassess our priorities, our scales of value, and so that we can realize, Lord, that material things are just that, they're material. But the most important things is storing up treasures in heaven because that's eternal and the rest of the things here we cannot even take with us. So I pray that you would help us to see um, what it is that we need to adjust, what it is that we need to change so that we can be in concert with your perfect will. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. And I pray all of these things through Christ's name. Amen. God bless you all, those online and in Elisa Viejo. Thank you for holding the line. And let's get busy sharing the cause of Christ. Keep your shields locked and loaded, and we will see each other soon, I'm confident. God bless you all. Bye-bye.